November 1943, Tehran, Persia. German paratroops have been dropped near the city. Their assignment, assassination. At the Russian embassy, a very special guest. And his host. At the British embassy next door. This meeting probably represented the greatest concentration of worldly power in the history of mankind. For security reasons, the President and the Prime Minister have pressed for a desert meeting place. But not for the first time, Stalin says no. He wants Tehran. This is a momentous appointment with history. The first meeting of the Big Three. The first summit. Tehran is the last stop on a journey. Churchill had stopped off at Malta to salute the brave people of the island. he met with Roosevelt and Generalissimo and Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Churchill and Roosevelt travel on to their rendezvous with Stalin. There is relief all round when the big three are safely inside their strongly defended compounds and the German assassins who had come to kill them are rounded up. The conference represented some 12 to 1400 millions of the human race who depended upon our reaching right conclusions. Together, we controlled practically all the naval and three quarters of all the air forces in the world and could erect armies of nearly 20 millions of men engaged in the most terrible of wars that had yet occurred in human history. The supreme issue at Tehran is the second front in Europe. For months, Stalin has been demanding this, and not only Stalin. Not only in Russia, but in England, the Second Front has become a political issue. War is war, but not folly. And it would be folly to invite a disaster which would help nobody. The suspicious Stalin has convinced himself that there will never be a second front. Roosevelt's bodyguard, Mike Riley, sees proof of it. The last night of the Tehran conference, uh, Stalin gave a tremendous banquet. I noticed the prime minister and Stalin in a very animated conversation towards the end of the banquet. Stalin got up from his chair and walked out of the room and Churchill actually, there's no other way to put it, pursued him and in, the out, out, in an outer room backed him into a corner and says, Marshal, I want to go up to visit your front. And Stalin coldly turned around and said, Mr. Prime Minister, when you have a front, then you may come and visit mine. 
At Tehran, Churchill and Roosevelt break the good news that the great invasion of France will positively take place early the following summer, 1944. The Tehran Conference concludes on a note of accord. The common understanding which we have reached guarantees that victory will be ours. We shall seek the cooperation and the active participation of all nations whose peoples are dedicated, as are our own peoples, to the elimination of tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance. We came here with hope and determination. We leave here friends in fact, in spirit and in purpose. From Tehran, Churchill and Roosevelt fly to Cairo. Churchill takes the president on a trip. A must for tourists in Egypt. I could not bear his leaving without seeing the Sphinx. We examined this wonder of the world from every angle. Roosevelt and I gazed at her for some minutes in silence as the evening shadows fell. Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Churchill moves on to Carthage, Allied military headquarters for the Mediterranean area. 2,000 years ago, headquarters of the great Hannibal. Suddenly a new crisis. Churchill has pneumonia. So oh, here I was at this pregnant moment on the broad of my back amid the ruins of ancient Carthage. Fever flickered in and out. I had not realized how much I had been weakened by my illness. Churchill's boundless energy comes to his aid. The doctor insists on a short convalescence. He moves on to a lovely oasis. I saw in my beloved Marrakesh a haven where I could regain my strength. I was utterly tired out. forces are building, but they are not yet of sufficient strength to undertake an assault against Hitler's fortress in the West. I pondered what best could be done to take the weight off the Russians. While the Allies build strength, the Russians bear the brunt of the war on the Eastern Front. <laughs> Churchill's solution is to stab harder at Italy, the soft underbelly. This will draw the reserve German divisions from France. And it will be a springboard to Central Europe, as General Mark Clark remembers. I'll never forget Mr. Churchill 
whom we met with often at Checkers and at 10 Downing Street, standing up at a map of the Mediterranean and pointing to the soft belly of the Mediterranean, as he called it. It later became my job to slit that soft underbelly, and I assure you that I found it, instead of being soft, to be a tough old gut. The Italian campaign starts well. Troops pour into Naples to reinforce the Allied army. In November comes a dramatic change. Sunny Italy puts on its winter coat. The advance bogs down. The soft underbelly grows a hard shell. In the mountain sectors near Venafro, the most mechanized army in all of history is dependent for all supplies on mules. We must continue to engage the enemy. We must not lose for a moment the sense of urgency in crisis which must continue to drive us even though we are in the fifth year of the war. We must go forward with unrelenting and unwearying efforts to every living minute that is granted to us. Ahead lies Casino. In Italy, the irresistible force seems to have met the immovable object at a place whose name is to burn its way into the tragic inventory of war. Casino. Monte Casino and its world-famous monastery founded by St. Benedict hundreds of years before. Several times in its long history, Benedict's monastery has known destruction. Now it is to die once again. century is a bastion of Christianity. In 1944, the storm center of the bitterest fighting on the Italian front. The height on which the monastery stood surveyed the junctions of the rivers Rapido and Liri and was the pivot of the whole German defense. In these rocky mountains, a great fortified system had been created with lavish use of concrete and steel. Field Marshal Kesselring's orders are clear. The Gustav line must be held at all costs. Your Fuhrer expects the bitterest struggle for every yard. From their observation posts on the heights, the enemy could direct their guns on all movement in the valley below. Where the mountains end, river and flood take over. This is the Gustav Line. The plan is to beat the Gustav line by outflanking it. 
First, an offensive at Casino. Then the trump card, a landing behind the German line. Because of Mr. Churchill's keen interest in Italy, it was sort of his baby. He came to see me on many occasions, and on one of them began to talk about another amphibious landing at Anzio, near Rome. He thought we should go in in a hurry, with perhaps two divisions. Having been through Salerno, I thought we needed more strength at Anzio, but he prevailed, and we went in with the two divisions, one British and one American, and we stayed there. It was with tense, but I trust suppressed excitement that I awaited the outcome of this considerable stroke. The Prime Minister sends this message. I'm very glad you are pegging out claims rather than digging in beachheads. Now came disaster and the ruin of the prime purpose of the enterprise. No general attempt to advance was made. Kesselring reacts quickly. Seeing that the Allies do not advance, he brings new divisions to Anzio from the north and masses them for a counteroffensive. Churchill is suspicious, as always, that his generals are being too cautious. Let me know the number of vehicles landed at Anzio by the 7th and 14th days. How many of our men are driving or looking after 18,000 vehicles in this narrow space? We must have a great superiority of chauffeurs. I'm shocked that the enemy have more infantry than we. In the crowd was Pipe Major Rowe of the Scots Guards. I was a member of the 24th Guards Brigade, who along with the 3rd American Rangers were the initial assault troops for the Anjou Beachhead. And this, I'd like to say as a British soldier, that I have never found a finer comrade in arms and in action as an American Ranger. At times, the forward posts of the two sides are only yards apart. There they remain. While the battle rages at Anzio, at Casino, an agonizing decision is made. The destruction of the Abbey. could not break the main front at Casino, and the Germans had equally failed to drive us into the sea at Anzio. The fate of Italy is indeed terrible. Here is this beautiful country, suffering the worst horrors of war, with a hideous prospect of the red-hot rake of the battle line being drawn from sea to sea, right up the whole length of the peninsula. We are all bound in solemn compact to fall upon and smite the Hun with all the strength that is in us.